The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, why the Southern Poverty Law Center is suing the Trump administration, plus Fred Wertheimer and the movement to restore ethics and integrity to government. And Bill Press talks with Amy Harder of Axios. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight, and follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. The president continues to pursue his policy to attach work requirements to Medicaid benefits. Our first guest says it's a policy that has a devastating impact on people's lives, which is why his organization is suing the Trump administration to stop it. And we say hello to Samuel Brook, who is the deputy legal director of the Economic Justice Project at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Samuel Brook, thank you for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. It's great to be with you. Well, today we're going to talk about work requirements. Remind us, if you will, let's kind of start at the beginning. What are the Medicaid work requirements? Yeah, this is a new thing that came about um, through the current, the Trump administration. Um, Previous administrations had always refused to permit this. The basic idea is that um, states may request that to be eligible for Medicaid, an individual would have to first show that they are working, that they're completing sufficient hours of work in order to be eligible. The Medicaid Act itself doesn't permit this. Uh, It is not a work program. It's supposed to be a program to help people gain access to health care if they're low income. Uh, So what the Secretary of Health and Human Services has done under the current administration is grant what's called a waiver, uh, basically saying uh, we'll permit you to uh, violate the Medicaid Act uh, for this specific limited purpose. And so they have tried to use this limited exception that's normally something that would be done to, for example, uh, try to make sure that people can get access more efficiently, um, maybe uh, help them to register in a different way or to get a different doctor arrangement set up. Uh, something that would be ideally set up to make the Medicaid system work better. They've instead tried to expand that exception into a wholesale rewrite of the Medicaid Act by trying to make it into a work requirements program. And so that's the basic idea uh, of what we are seeing and, of course, what we are challenging. Mm -hmm. Now, you've called the policy a failed and punitive experiment. What doesn't work with work requirements? Yeah, I mean, the whole premise is backward. The premise is an assumption that if people are working, they therefore will be healthy. And and that gets it exactly wrong. Uh, what all the evidence shows is that by, by in enabling people to have access to health care, they can then become healthy. And by becoming healthy, they can then hold down a job, get a job. Uh, engage in the workforce. Um, they, are, they are flipping the script on its head purely as a punitive measure um, to try to force more people off the rolls. This is clearly a response to uh, the Obama administration's uh, decision under their leadership to expand, the, uh, expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act to grant more access to more individuals to health care. Um, Kentucky was the first state to get approved for this work requirement waiver. Uh, And when they got approved, they were saying quite explicitly, they were doing this to try to target that expansion population, to try to put a stop to um, what they see as an overextension of of government help um, to individuals who are low income and are struggling to get by. What are the stereotypes embedded in these programs? 
Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question because the, clearly we have talked about work requirements some in the past for other types of benefits. Um, uh, SNAP food stamps has a, has a work component uh, in it, although often that's waived. I, I think that overall we've seen this, we saw this in 1996 when those requirements were put in place for food stamps, um, and, and we're seeing it again now, an assumption that individuals who are getting federal government help are somehow lazy, are, are just um, trying to live off the government and, and not take care of themselves or, or look after themselves. I, I, this is particularly pernicious in the Medicaid context because we've seen some people say, oh, they're getting a handout. I mean, th there's no handout here. There's no money being given. This is to help people allow themselves to get health coverage, uh, to be able to go and see the doctors so that they can take care of themselves. Uh, if, if there were ever a policy or program that was based on personal responsibility, it would be the Medicaid program precisely because the only quote unquote benefit that someone is getting is that they're able to take care of themselves and get the health care that they need so that they can be living a full and vibrant life. But inherent in this language, they talk about people being quote unquote able-bodied um, uh, or, or that they're doing quote unquote you know, community engagement. All of this is code in our view for requiring uh, individuals who otherwise should be eligible, um, putting red tape in their way so that they won't be able to gain as easy access. And that's a big problem because inherent in that is that every time you put another burden in front of someone, uh, the consequences are that more people are not going to be able to complete the requirements, especially when we're talking about the target population for Medicaid, low-income working individuals who are, who are just trying to get by, and the last thing they need to do is suddenly do a, a monthly reporting requirement. Uh, unfortunately, we're seeing the consequences of this. Um, there have been, I mentioned Kentucky before, the other state that's been approved is Arkansas, and theirs has actually gone into effect, and we're actually seeing that thousands of individuals are being kicked off for no reason other than that they weren't able to get this reporting requirements done to establish that they had completed this work requirement. We're speaking with Samuel Brook, who's the Deputy Legal Director of the Economic Justice Project at the Southern Poverty Law Center. We're discussing Medicaid work requirements today on the America's Democrats podcast. Sam, who are the people most affected by these requirements? Yeah, this is very much targeting low-income individuals, um, especially in the two states that have gotten the approval. Um, it's largely targeting what's called the expansion population. And so what that means is the Medicaid program originally was focused on low-income individuals who met certain qualifications, like they were a, a child or they were a caretaker, a parent of a child, um, or they had um, other types of things. Uh, they were blind or they were disabled. Um, the expansion of Medicaid changed this fundamentally by saying, we're going to look just at your income and we're going to make anyone eligible. So anyone who's low income, um, would be eligible regardless of whether they were married, had a child, single, it, it, it no longer mattered. Um, and, and this is huge because this was part of the Affordable Care Act's effort to get to much closer to universal coverage. Of course, we haven't gotten to universal coverage, but states that expanded Medicaid, like Kentucky, you know, saw their uninsured rate go down from something like in the 30s, like 37% down to like 11%. So we saw huge gains being made. It's these individuals who are being targeted by this new system that if they aren't able to complete these requirements, um, they're going to be kicked off of the program and no longer be able to be eligible. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to be most severely felt uh, by those who don't have access to the Internet, because in Arkansas, they only allow you to um, log these uh, work hours and just show that you're compliant by, by going online. Um, it's going to be particularly difficult for individuals who struggle uh, it, to meet the, the community engagement requirements because there aren't enough jobs or they're not able to get enough hours. Um, we've certainly talked to individuals who are doing everything they can to find work, but aren't able to get the full amount needed, either because they're not able to work completely. Um, they may have some health issues that are allowing them to do some things, but not, but not work full time. Or they may just be struggling to find work. Um, even though in this economy, we keep hearing about very low in, uh, unemployment numbers, uh, there are still large segments of the population, particularly in rural areas, where uh, employment is still hard to locate and hard 
hard to find. And it's all of these individuals who are clearly going to be the most severely affected uh, and, and exactly the people that the Affordable Care Act was intending uh, to help by expanding Medicaid. Now, how many of these work requirements have actually been in place, been put in place so far? And what do we know about the their impact on people's lives? Yeah. So uh, there have been a couple of states that have been approved, um, but only one state has actually put it into effect. Kentucky was going to be the first, but a federal court blocked it just uh, the day before it was going to go into effect. And so uh, the federal court said this is completely arbitrary. Uh, they're, you're, you're basically rewriting the federal statutes that Congress passed. You, the federal executive, the the uh, the executive branch, you can't do that. You can't. It's for Congress to decide what the statutes say and what they mean. It's not for the executive to rewrite it and impose this work requirement on Medicaid that was never intended to have these types of bureaucratic hurdles put in place before people could get access to health care. Arkansas is the other state, and there the provision has gone into effect. Um, it's being challenged in court as well on the same grounds. We're hopeful that the court will rule in the same way. We, we expect that it will. Um, but, it, but in the meantime, this provision was permitted to go into effect. And the consequences have been devastating. Uh, uh, the Arkansas rules are a little different. They say that you have to have three months of noncompliance and then you'll be kicked off. Well, the first time that we got to that three-month mark, uh, 4,000 people were kicked off. The next month, another 4,000, and the next month, another 4,000. So we've had about 12,000 people kicked off of the Medicaid program in Arkansas thus far. And uh, at the end of November, uh, another 6,000 are at risk because they have already accumulated two months of noncompliance. And so if they're noncompliant or, or not uh, satisfying these requirements in, 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 the, in the month of November, they'll be kicked off as well. And, you know, again, this is particularly pernicious in Arkansas because they have created a system that's intended to make it difficult for people. They have created a process that allows people only to register um, these requirements, their, their compliance with these requirements online through an online system. It's only available from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Even though people might be working jobs and trying to get things done, they get home late at night and try to do this. They can't go on the website after 9. Uh, they do maintenance on the website during those hours when they're otherwise requiring people to try to log in and, and, and make these reports. So, again, the website isn't even available. And, of course, Arkansas is a very rural state, uh, has one of the highest rates of, of, of non-access to broadband Internet. And so there are lots of individuals who just don't have access to the Internet, and it's not trivial for them to um, just quickly jump online to, to log into a website and make these reported changes. Um, all of this is showing that individuals uh, who need health care um, are being thrown off precisely because of simply these bureaucratic hurdles. One of the clients that we're representing is an individual who um, is suffering from, uh, from HIV, and, and he has lost access. He's HIV positive. He has lost access to Medicaid uh, because he was not able to complete the requirements. Um, in fact, in his case, uh, he did complete the requirements, but he thought that um, he was told that he only needed to uh, register one time that he was working, and he thought that he'd done that, and he was in the clear. Um, little did he know that he was accumulating all this time, months of of non-reported work, and therefore he was kicked off. Uh, and, and that's exactly the, the, the situation where someone like this, who was working, um, was holding down a job, was doing his best, but didn't have time to uh, stay up to date on all of these things, all of these requirements, um, didn't realize that he had to be doing these other things. And this is exactly the bureaucratic hurdles that is going to snare people um, just like him, people who clearly do need health care. And frankly, people who even by the own program were complying with the program's requirements. Well, of course, SPLC is part of a legal part of a team of legal advocates uh, challenging the Medicaid work requirements in Arkansas, Kentucky and other states. Where are we in this case? I mean, are, are, are you seeing positive uh, steps being taken or is it two steps forward, one step back? Yeah, it still very much feels like two steps forward, one step back. We um, we won in Kentucky, uh, and we're partnering with other great groups. The National Health Law Program uh, is in all of the cases. They're a fantastic group, and we have 
local groups, the Kentucky Equal Justice Center in Kentucky, the Legal Aid of Arkansas in Arkansas. In Kentucky, we won in the first instance, the court threw out the approval by the federal government of this work requirement and said it was completely arbitrary and capricious because there was no basis in law for them to do this. But what the court did, which was appropriate, was it sent it back to the federal government and said, you, 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 you messed up, you didn't follow the law do whatever you want to do. Uh, you can try again if you want to. Um, and the federal government chose to try again. So in Kentucky, they re-approved um, the work requirement waiver um, in for Kentucky. Uh, you know, this is perhaps telling in and of itself. They, they announced that publicly uh, Tuesday night before Thanksgiving at about 8 p.m. Eastern time, you know, precisely at a time when the press was least likely to cover it, I think. Um, but so because they did that, we're now back in court um, and we'll be challenging that again. Um, so the Kentucky one, you know, we had a, a win on the version 1.0. I guess we're now in the second quarter and we're we're going at it again. Arkansas the um, again, it went into effect. Thousands of people have been kicked off because it went into effect. That is being challenged in federal court as well. And we're certainly hopeful that the court will reach the same conclusion as in Kentucky, saying that this was completely unauthorized and illegal um, and, and not permitted under the Medicaid Act. Um, but really, where it goes from here is unclear. There are another about 10 states that are seeking um, waiver uh, uh, work requirement waivers um, and are waiting on the federal government to approve them or are um, in the process of implementing them, but their implementation is far off. You know, it's not in a few months, it's in, it's in a year or two. And so the, the, what we hope what we hope will happen is that as we continue to win in court, the federal government will stop this illegal process that they're undertaking and they won't continue to approve these. Um, but it's hard to say. Um, we, we don't know for sure what the federal government will do. So from our perspective, what our goal and our, and our, our objective is in order to help the low income individuals that we're looking after and, and trying, to, trying to take care of um, is to continue challenging these in court whenever we have to and get the rulings in court, continue to demand that the state leaders and the federal government stop approving these. But if they, if they do, if they keep marching forward with them, um, we'll continue suing in federal court until they stop and until we get an administration who understands that the whole idea of Medicaid is to help people get access to health care. It's not a system that's intended to be designed to uh, create bureaucratic hurdles for people like a work requirements. Mm -hmm. Well, and now that we're uh, post midterm elections, Sam, do you hope you have some hope anyway that lawmakers at the national and state level will begin to put the brakes on the work requirements? Well, it's really interesting because in Wisconsin, for example, um, they had just been approved for a work for a work requirement waiver um, about a week or two before the midterms. And uh, in the in the gubernatorial race, in the governor's race, um, a different governor was elected. Um, and so Scott Walker lost that election. And as a result of that, we are cautiously optimistic that um, the the new governor will choose to not go forward with the work requirements program, which it is uh, their prerogative to to do to put that on hold and to and to to stop it. So there is some reason for optimism. At the same time, at the federal government level, this is controlled by the executive branch. This is controlled by the the Secretary of Health and Human Services. You know that that's. Um, that that position hasn't materially changed. So um, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're cautiously optimistic that obviously on the issue of health care, it did very well in the midterms. Three states chose to expand Medicaid by voter referendum. So um, I think that takes us up to about 39 states now that will have expanded Medicaid. So the clear verdict or outcome of the midterm elections was that people want access to health care and the current administration should stop interfering with that. But whether or not this administration has gotten that message is a whole other matter. And so we're not, you know, we're, we're cautiously optimistic. Obviously, the midterms were good for, for these issues in terms of voters making their preferences clear. Um, but we think that there's still going to be a lot of work that we need to do in the courts. Um, and, and we don't think that this issue has gone away. Mm -hmm. And we just can only hope that it uh, moves forward in a positive way. Samuel Brook, Deputy Legal Director of the Economic Justice Project at the Southern Poverty Law Center, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Sam, thank you so much for your time with us today. We look forward to having you back again with us soon. Thank you so much. It's been great to be with you. Thank you. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. <laughs> ¡Gracias!
We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This social security measure, I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing, or one time, in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job, that's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up next, continuing the battle for ethics and government, we'll be joined by Fred Wertheimer. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. In a recent two-panel cartoon, a character holds a sign saying, First, they came for the reporters. In the next panel, his sign says, We don't know what happened after that. It was, of course, a retort to Donald Trump's ignorant campaign to demonize the news media as, quote, the enemy of the people. But the worst enemy of America's local and regional newspapers is not our ranting president, but a new breed of fast buck hucksters who've scooped up hundreds of America's newspapers from the bargain bins of media sell-offs. The buyers are hedge fund scavengers with nondescript names like Digital First and Gatehouse. They know nothing about journalism and care less for their Wall Street profiteers out to grab big bucks fast by slashing the journalistic staffs of each paper, voiding all employee benefits, shriveling the paper's size and news content, selling the presses and other assets, tripling the price of their inferior product, then declaring bankruptcy, shutting down the paper and auctioning off the bones before moving on to plunder another town's paper. America's two largest newspaper chains today are not venerable publishers with a basic commitment to civic responsibility, but Gatehouse and Digital First, whose managers believe that good journalism is measured by the personal profits they can squeeze from it. As revealed last year in an American Prospect article, Gatehouse executives had demanded that his papers cut $27 million from their operating expenses, eliminating jobs and slashing paychecks. Meanwhile, one employee... The hedge fund CEO extracted $54 million in personal pay from the conglomerate, including an $11 million bonus. This is Jim Hightower saying, To these absentee Wall Street owners, newspapers are no more than big pipelines, a means of hauling enormous financial wealth and social well-being out of our communities. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Fred Wertheimer has played a key role in every major campaign, finance reform, and ethics battle in Congress since the post-Watergate reforms in the 1970s. He continues that career now as president of Democracy 21, where he calls on a new Congress to restore integrity to governing. And we say hello to Fred Wertheimer, founder and president of Democracy 21. Fred, it's an honor to have you on the program with us today. Thanks very much. Happy to be here. 
Well, we are pleased to have you with us. So let's start with one of the most immediate concerns of Democracy 21, Matthew Whitaker. Your organization is one of 29, which sent a letter to members of Congress calling for Whitaker to be recused from overseeing the Mueller investigation. Why, for starters, is this so important? And what are your hopes that Congress will protect the Mueller investigation? Well, uh, Mr. Whitaker, before he... Uh, went to work at the Justice Department, made all kinds of attacks on the Mueller investigation. Uh, he made very clear that he was hostile to the investigation, biased against the investigation. And now we turn around and he has been given oversight responsibility for the investigation by the president, who clearly has put him in there as someone to try to protect President Trump's interests. Uh, but that's not the job of a Justice Department official. A Justice Department official is supposed to protect the interests of the American people. So uh, we wanted to, to go on record and make very clear that this person is not qualified to oversee the investigation and should be recused. Uh, now, we are part of a very large coalition that has been working uh, literally since Mueller was appointed to protect the Mueller investigation. That's our goal. Uh, and we have done this through uh, public protests. We have done this through pressing for legislation in Congress. Uh, and uh, we are doing that now. Uh, we have not seen any evidence yet that Mr. Whitaker has interfered with the ele with the investigation. Uh, but this is a, a critically important investigation. There, there's no question that Russia uh, invaded our democracy in 2016 with the clear goal of interfering with the election. Uh, and we've got to get to the bottom of it. The American people have to know what's going on, and they have to know whether there was any uh, uh, involvement of the president's campaign uh, in this effort. Uh, so far, we, as I say, we have not seen any evidence of uh, interference with the Mueller investigation. But if there is interference... Uh, we will do everything we can to make sure the investigation can go forward, is protected, uh, and Mr. Mueller can complete his work without interference. Let's look at some of the central concerns of your organization, money and politics. Do you see openings in this new Congress to take action on campaign finance reform, and what would that look like? Well, we do see openings, and... We see the beginning of an effort. These are very difficult fights that take time. The last fight uh, that was won, the so-called McCain-Feingold bill to ban unlimited contributions to the national parties, took five years. But we are operating in an atmosphere where uh, the American people clearly see Washington as a rigged system and political money playing a central role in corrupting the system. Uh, and the President Trump and his administration make the case for this problem on a regular, uh, for dealing with this problem on a regular basis. Now, uh, we have a commitment from the current leadership of the House, the newly controlled Democratic House, to move forward immediately next year with a series of democracy reforms, not just campaign finance reform, but voting rights reform, uh, attacks on gerrymandering by creating nonpartisan redistricting commissions, ethics reforms, a holistic approach to democracy reform. On the campaign finance side, we have to create an alternative way for candidates to run for office. 
without becoming immediately dependent and obligated to their funder, to big funders. Uh, for us, that means a system of small contributions matched by multiple public funds, such as a six to one match for contributions up to $200. That could provide the resources for incumbent candidates and new candidates from all walks of life to raise enough money to run competitive campaigns without having to indebt themselves uh, to big money funders. We have a system the Supreme Court created where huge contributions are being spent on the outside of the political campaigns, uh, funded by the wealthiest people in America. In 2016, just 100 people gave $1 billion to super PACs. That's an average of $10 million per person. We can't get rid of that as long as the Supreme Court holds that as the law of the land. But what we can do is give people a different way to run for office so that they can be elected without those people having their claws in them. We can also empower ordinary Americans by making their small contributions far more important. Now, small contributions got a big surge in the 2018 congressional races and played a big role in the election of a number of the challengers who won. But we need a systemic approach. Uh, uh, a, a good part of the motivation for small contributions to Democrats in 2018 uh, was generated by concerns about President Trump. We need a systemic approach, and this is the kind of approach that that can make a huge difference, diminish the influence of big money in Washington, uh, and provide more of a fair chance for ordinary Americans to get the kind of policies that they want. The reforms also would include uh, major disclosure laws to close the gaping disclosure loopholes that allow dark money, undisclosed money, to be laundered into the elections, uh, efforts to fix the election commission that is supposed to enforce these laws but is uh, completely dysfunctional. If we can pass this comprehensive democracy reform bill in January, it will lay down a marker for the battles that lie ahead. Uh, and we will then take, we being a very large coalition, take this into the elections in 2020, build support in the Senate, and look to enact this legislation uh, in either 2021 or 2023, if it takes that long, to build the support. We also have built this year the biggest coalition ever formed to support a series of democracy reforms. There have been in our large coalitions that support voting rights and that support other aspects of government reform, but we've never had a coalition devoted to fixing the political system at all fronts, not just one piece at a time. There are 110 national organizations in this coalition now ready to fight for these reforms, and it's growing as we go on. We're speaking with Fred Wertheimer, founder and president of Democracy 21. Fred, Democracy 21 is also very involved in voting rights, which you touched on a moment ago. And you've got a long track record in advocating for free and fair elections. In looking back at the midterms and the many claims of voter suppression, are we at a unique moment in our history? Yes, we are. We're, um, we're back to the era of uh, the, this is the modern equivalent of the poll tax, which was used to prevent poor people, minorities, from voting. Uh, we have had all kinds of laws adopted in states to suppress the vote. We have these phony arguments being made uh, that there is all kinds of voter fraud, and no one has been able to document that but it is used to, to pass laws, the only purpose of which 
is to limit the ability of people to get to the ballot box and vote. So this legislation that I've been talking about would restore the Voting Rights Act, which was gutted by the Supreme Court, but not on constitutional grounds, on statutory grounds, so we can fix it. And that law, in effect, protected against uh, voter suppression in the states with the worst track records for it. There's also a, a provision to require automatic voter registration, which would mean that any time you uh, approached or dealt with any agency, you would automatically be registered. Uh, one of the biggest problems in this country is that we have tens and tens of millions of people who aren't registered to vote, so they can't even begin to figure out how to get to to vote because they're not registered. Uh, the the number of people who are registered and vote is a is a high percentage. Uh, the biggest problem in terms of the percentage of people not voting comes from people who aren't registered. So that's another uh, big problem. And then we have the issue of, of people being purged from the voting uh, rolls, uh, vote, uh, early voting periods being uh, reduced. There's been a concerted effort to block people from voting uh, and we haven't we haven't been in this stage uh, probably since the 50s, uh, and people are fighting it. They're fighting it effectively in places, uh, and with this kind of legislation, we could turn it around. This presidential administration has proven to be a minefield in terms of ethics. What would you like to see this new Congress do to return transparency and ethics to government? Well, we have a series of problems, and it starts with the president. Uh, the president has never disclosed his tax returns. He never uh, divested his business interests, so he's a walking conflict of interest. Uh, he leaves himself and the country open to foreign interests doing business with his uh, hotels and golf clubs, etc., and providing him financial benefits as they curry favor with him. Uh, we have revolving door problems. Uh, we've had a number of people who have been lobbying against laws that exist who are now theoretically supposed to enforce those laws. And they're opposed to them. So there are a number of proposals that uh, would apply to presidents and vice presidents to make sure that they do not have conflicts of interest, to strengthen doors to prevent re uh, the revolving door where people take advantage of their government positions to go out and get lucrative jobs and go back and influence their former colleagues in the executive branch. There's, there's legislation to strengthen the Office of Government Ethics. Now, there's not a final bill yet. So these are ideas and proposals. A number of these bills have been around in Congress for some time, uh, but the Republican-controlled Congress did not want to consider them. Uh, so the bills I'm talking about are the kinds of bills that that will probably be incorporated in what is called H.R. 1, which will be the first bill considered in the new Congress. But if you look at it, uh, we've got a broken political system. We've got big, big problems with corruption flowing from political money influencing Washington. We have voter suppression in ways that we haven't seen in decades. We've got redistricting in which the, the representatives get to choose their voters rather than voters choosing their representatives because these districts are gerrymandered in a way that 
uh, representatives are just simply safe. We don't have real elections. And we've got big ethics problems. Uh, so we've got to approach this in a way that we address all of this. Uh, on the money and politics issue, you cannot solve the problem of big money disproportionately influencing elections and corruptly influencing government decisions unless you create an alternative way for people to finance their campaigns. If we don't create something like the multiple matching system I described, so you or anyone else can run for office based on small contributions, which are not going to buy influence, uh, we're going to not be able to solve the problems of corruption and a rigged system in Washington. So the challenge is great, but there's an opportunity that doesn't come along very often. Uh, and our view is this is the time to seize the moment. We can get a terrific start in January by passing H.R. 1, uh, and then we go into a battle that will take some time, that will be difficult, but that can be won. These battles have been won in the past, and they will be won again in the future. And, and Fred, before we let you go, there, have been, there has been no shortage of doomsayers claiming that democracy could die in the United States. What gives you hope that democracy will, in fact, survive? Well, just look at the problems that the Trump administration has caused. The president seems to have no interest in the rule of law. Uh, and look at, look at what, what's happened in the courts. Our system has worked to hold the president accountable, even when he and his party have had total control of the executive branch and the Congress. The courts have ruled over and over again against the excesses of President Trump. Now, we now have a body of Congress, the House, that can hold him accountable. And you will see that happen in this next Congress. So I, look, I have a very simple way of looking at this. We got through the Civil War. We got through World War I. We got through the Great Depression. We got, we got through World War II. Uh, we've got through the Vietnam War, we got through Watergate, and we'll get through this. Ah, a breath of fresh air and optimism. Fred Wertheimer, founder and president of Democracy 21, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Fred, as always, we appreciate your time with us today, and hopefully we can have you back again soon and talk more about these topics. Happy to do it. Happy to be with you. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st century Democrats, on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press talks with Amy Harder of Axios on why the failure to confront climate change will cost far more than it's worth. Again, we welcome to the studio Amy Harder, who covers climate issues, uh, energy issues for uh, the great Axios, axios.com. Hello, Amy. Nice to see you. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming in. Uh, we've been at it for a while. I uh, wanted to check in with uh, comments. Peter? Yes, indeed. A couple of comments on Twitter, at BP Show, at BP Show. Okay, uh, so on uh, the California situation, Romaine, our buddy Romaine from Chicago, says regarding California, look at what happens when you actually don't concede on election night and <laughs> actually count all of the absentee ballots oh, and other gee. votes. Yes. Yeah, what a novel concept before. <laughs> also, shout out to Stanger. Stanger is a new uh, viewer, listener to the show. 
Stenger says, Bill, I never saw your show before. I just came across it while I was channel surfing. Same anti-American talk this country doesn't need. Congrats, idiot. <laughs> yeah. Well, go like away, that. idiot. Yeah, I figured you'd like that. <laughs> yeah. If you have There's a comment. another channel called Fox. Yeah. You, you, might, you, might, like yeah, that. you might be happier there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, if you have any comments on any topic at any time, find us on Twitter at BP Show, at BP Show. All right. Uh, yeah, so, Amy, um, I was down at the White House yesterday when the president was taking off for um, uh, Mississippi, and he stopped and talked to us on the South Lawn. Uh, he had some very profound, detailed criticism of the uh, climate change report, which came out on Friday. Um, obviously, he had spent a lot of time over the weekend at Mar-a-Lago studying the climate change report. Here was his analysis. Yeah, I don't believe it. No, no, I don't believe it. There you go. How about it? Uh, do you think he ever read it? I mean, I think this is par for the course for the president and climate change issues and other issues as well. I mean, I, I, I don't think we should uh, expect him to take the time to read this report. Uh, I, I've likened this to By sort the way, of- I would give him that, right? If I were president, I probably would not read 1,600 pages. But I, th- I know that I would want a pretty detailed briefing and an executive right. summary. As, as I was saying, I think yeah. um, I, I don't expect him to uh, read it. And I also don't expect him to suddenly change his mind and say, oh, yeah, because there's a 1,600-page report, I suddenly decide to acknowledge that climate change is real. That's not how the politics of the Republican Party and climate change work. It is not about the science. It is about the policies that the science says is necessary, which necessarily involve bigger government, and Republicans don't like that. So it's actually quite simple. Senator James Inhofe, when he went on the Rachel Maddow show a few years ago on MSNBC, he said this, and I quote, or I paraphrase, uh, I should say, but you can find this online. He, Senator Inhofe, a Republican from, from Oklahoma, who's one of the biggest climate skeptics there are, he, he it was actually for climate change until he found out how much it cost. Uh, So this is not about the science. It's just easier to deny and ignore the science than it is to have a substantive debate about a very, very difficult problem. Okay, But what are this? To me, there's an internal contradiction there. Of course Uh, there is. I mean, it's it's, but if you talk about the cost of whatever changes might be necessary to the way we produce electricity or something, I'm not sure what those costs are. But whatever they are, you have to compare them to the costs, which is which this report on Friday spoke to, the cost of doing nothing and the cost to the long-term cost to the economy, correct? Right. So are we De- talking short-term versus long-term? Exactly. And that's, you know, a classic challenge that humanity does a very job, very bad job at prioritizing long-term priorities for short-term gains. And of course... Um, but the, I'm not excusing these politicians. I'm yeah. simply explaining yeah. uh, no, I understand. their positions. Right. And so, you know, no matter what, there will be costs if we ignore climate change or if we act on climate change. I think most of uh, the the expertise out there shows that if you act on climate change, there will be losers. Coal will decline. It is already declining in the U.S., but not as much around the world. But there'll also be a lot of gains. So there'll be losses and there'll be gains with climate, um, with acting on climate change and reducing carbon emissions. Um, not acting on climate change is less clear who the winners will be. Now, there will be winners, in fact. It'll be insurance companies and <coughs> people building seawalls. You know, there'll be people out there trying to make money on climate change getting worse. But I, the, the literature I've read, it shows that the costs will be less even and, and messier if, if we don't act on climate change. I think they're enormous if we don't act and manageable if we do. Um, but let, let me, let's back up and not assume that everyone was uh, glued to the tube Friday afternoon after Thanksgiving when this report came out. And tell us a little bit about the report. First of all, 13 federal agencies. Right. This is um, a report that's required by Congress every four years, and it's required by law. It was initially uh, required as part of a a law that uh, Republican President George H.W. Bush uh, 
put into place back in the late 1980s. So it's been something that's been done for a while. And it's input about 13 federal agencies. And this is actually the second half of the report that was initially released about a year ago, again, under the Trump administration. So this Mm -hmm. is just continuing what I call a split screen strategy. You have the, the president tweeting, mocking climate change, global warming, saying if it's cold outside, uh, it must not be real, which, of course, is not true. Um, and then on the other hand, you have the administration not doing anything that could really legally jeopardize them. Now, there's some experts out there, those with a bias against the president, who say that issuing this report, acknowledging climate change, saying that there's going to be big costs, and then rolling back uh, climate change regulations that were issued under President Obama, they say that could put them into some legal jeopardy. I think that's a little bit too soon to tell. I think the bigger legal issues would have come up if they had tried to stifle the report. Right. Uh, on the on that famous tweet of the president's... It, Which, by a, the way, is almost identical to one that he did uh, last Christmas. Last Christmas, right. Yeah. That, oh, uh, it's, it's like the Macy's Day Parade, right? The Thanksgiving Parade. It was the coldest day, coldest day ever for the Thanksgiving Parade. Whatever happened to global warming? I mean, as if, if for global warming, there will never be another cold day, Right. Right. And part of the problem. What's wrong with that? Well, part of the problem with climate change is that it is very complicated. And most people don't like to engage on most complicated topics. I mean, there's a a huge contingency of the United States public that doesn't even know who the vice president is. Should we ask them to get. uh, They're lucky. Right. But (laughs) that was under President Obama as well, I should say. Yeah, you're uh, right. It's just we, we can't expect people to really understand something as complicated as climate change. And I think. Uh, the brief scientific explanation is that climate change creates more extreme extremes. So there could be more extreme colds. It's not like it won't be cold and it won't snow anymore. But from from a fake news perspective, it's really easy to fake climate change news, uh, which is really unfortunate for this issue. I mean, we're we're having a hard enough time talking about you know, whether or not Trump's inauguration crowd was the biggest, when you can point to a photo that simply shows that it wasn't climate yeah, change, right. you can create a chart that shows anything. Um, and that's why this is so complicated. Right. So the report did did talk about the cost, particularly the cost to the American economy, right? Right. Uh, stating what? Basically? Stating that without any action to curb emissions and that some of these impacts are already underway could cost hundreds of billions of dollars. I think the outer range was something like 10 percent of the GDP. But that's a relatively extreme um, number that I wouldn't where would that damage, put in the headline. Where would that damage uh, be felt? I mean, I think it's, it's very uneven. I think, you know, the Southwest will be a lot of fires. I mean, the, the California fires are a great example of how climate change is impacting us today. I've likened climate change to diabetes for the planet. It's not cre- it doesn't start the fire, right? Nothing climate change isn't out there with a with a match, mm-hmm. but as soon as the fire starts, it makes it worse. And that's what diabetes is like for people who get who have a health condition, diabetes makes it worse. And so that makes it difficult sometimes to pinpoint the cost because you could say, "Oh, this wildfire is really expensive because forest management has been bad." Well, that's true. It's also true that climate change is making it it spread faster and quicker because it's so dry. Right. Uh, and the report did say that the Cali- what we see in California, which now it's a basically a 12-month fire season, it used to be maybe three or four months, um, could spread to the south rest of, to the southwest and to the southeast as mm-hmm. well, where we did see a big fire earlier this year or last year. Yeah, right. right. I, to your question, you know, about— but, well, I'm sorry. I'm just about the cost. I mean, you'll see it in wildfires. You'll see it in more frequent flooding in Florida and other places. And we're already seeing a lot of this. Mm -hmm. And we have this debate raging here in Washington about whether or not this issue is real. But then you have city officials uh, in Florida and elsewhere dealing with this. And so on a daily basis already. And so it's 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 hard to to sort of combine these two conversations. But you have to both adapt to a warmer world that we're facing today, regardless but also try to mitigate it going forward. Climate change is not this binary thing. Are we going to solve it or are we not going to solve it? Right. Uh, other segments of the economy the report talked about, as I recall, agriculture particularly. 
Right. Uh, I think in the Midwest, you're going to see crops um, f- having a harder time to grow because of, of droughts. I, in fact, uh, grew up on a, a, a cattle ranch in eastern Washington state. And I was just talking to my family the other day. And, and apparently there's this new insurance program where if it doesn't, um, if there's no drought, um, farms and ranchers actually get money um, because the insurance companies are insuring against droughts. And this is a new program over the last couple of years. And those are the types of things that you're going to see. Now, I will say you know, climate change is on a net, uh, a negative for uh, the planet. But there's going to be some positives. For instance, farmers in in Canada are being able to grow crops that they couldn't grow. And I'm not saying that to say that we should. It's just this is a really nuanced issue. And I think in order to have a substantive conversation, I think it's important to be like, yeah, there'll be some positives. But hey, those positives do not outweigh the negatives. All right. So this report, again, by these federal agencies, really echoes the report that came from the United Nations uh, last spring, right, which was a global scientist all around the world. Right. That report, um, which was a long time in the making um, by the United Nations, uh, basically laid out what it would take to uh, limit t- uh, global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Mm-hmm. It's technically which possible. Which was the goal of the Paris well, Accord, correct. correct? The goal of the Paris Accord was to limit well below 2 degrees Celsius, which one could assume to be 1.5. Now, that report said that technically it's possible, but polit- politically it is almost impossible. I just did a column the other day. I have my weekly column at Axios Harder Line. Axios Harder Line. Yep. I yep. like that. Thanks. Uh, and harderline.com or Ax- no, Axios? No, Axios.com, and then you can find it on there. Got it. And, you know, I did a column the other day that was just, you know, I laid out some of these really stark numbers. I mean, the U.N. report uh, says that we need to uh, get to zero net emissions within the next 30, 35 years, because that's 2050, which it seems far away. But actually, it's only 30 it's, it's years. Not. Yeah. And we haven't had a year where we haven't increased emissions uh, absent economic crises since the Industrial Revolution in this world. There's been a couple of years where they haven't grown, but they've never decreased except mm. for when the, the world economy So it's tanking. an impossible goal. You know, that's it's it looks pretty impossible to me. And and some people criticized me and said, oh, you're throwing in the towel. And it's like, well, I'm a journalist. It's not my job to hold the towel, let alone throw it anywhere. And I was simply laying it out. And, you know, you can uh, score in the messenger if you want. That's fine. I have, um, as our, our founder Jim Vandehei says, you have to have skin like a rhino. Mm-hmm. in this world. Um, it's going to be very difficult, which is why I think this conversation and this report uh, that the U.S. government just released is so important. Things need to be start being done today to adapt to this world, even while we continue this debate about how to reduce emissions. Right. Um, and um, we did have a, a step toward that with the clean power plan under Obama, right? Which, right. In terms of existing coal-fired plants or new Mm-hmm. Um, and those that plan is gone. Right. I will say, though, that that plan was actually in a very unusual step by the Supreme Court in February 2016. They actually temporarily blocked that regulation, given the unprecedented nature of it. So it wasn't in effect when, mm-hmm. oh, when Trump uh, began the process of repealing, and it wasn't going into effect anytime soon. Uh, it was a significant regulation for the symbolism of it. The, the electricity sector here in the United States is already reducing emissions at a pretty startling rate, um, regardless of regulations. Um, so, and actually, the Trump administration issued a replacement regulation that technically and legally does regulate carbon emissions from power plants, and that will insulate them from uh, loss uh, from losing in court. Um, now it doesn't do much. It's very, it's pretty toothless, but it still technically regulates it. So, so um, California this year, uh, Governor Jerry Brown signed legislation. Uh, I'm, I don't have it exactly right, but basically zero emissions by 2050 or mm-hmm. something like that. It's a hundred percent zero emission uh, by 2050. I think that's what it is. Is that? And it's not just renewable energy. It's it can be other things. You, they can import uh, nuclear power, for instance, which is pretty controversial in California. Um, so it's a very significant law. And I think in the absence, is it doable? 
Well, I think California will be the test case. Uh, I, I chatted when, when with... When you think about it, when you... The fifth largest economy in the world, right? Uh, the largest state in the United States. If California can do it, then why can't other countries do it? Well, I think... Or our country do it. I think California is not states. is not nearly as dependent upon coal as a lot of other countries and a lot of other states in the U.S. are. So um, I think... It just really depends on where you're talking in the U.S. and and where in the world. I spoke with um, Ernest Moniz. But, but it still needs a lot of energy, right? I mean, you've got oh, yes. a lot of homes, right. a lot of electricity. Mm-hmm. It's got to be generated somehow. If not by coal, then... Right. And right now, uh, California gets a lot of its electricity from natural gas, which, of yeah. course, is cleaner than coal but still emits uh, carbon mm-hmm. emissions. I spoke with Ernest Moniz, uh, Obama's uh, former, former energy, energy secretary. secretary. Right. Correct. Right after that law passed. And he he was, of course, praising the law, but he also outlined some really big challenges, like how to store uh, wind and solar power, which, of course, when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining. He's not talking about for a little while. He's talking about for days and weeks and months, because that's the type of thing that we're going to need if we're going to have this type of build out of renewable energy. He also talked about land development. You're going to need a lot of land for wind and solar. You talk about nimbyism, not in my backyard. That type of protest and opposition uh, affects every type of energy source. When it's in your backyard, you're not going to like it, a lot of people anyway, um, whether it's an oil drill or a wind turbine. And so there's going to be a lot of challenges. And I think California will be the test case for that. And it'll continue the further separation between a lot of the U.S. and California. You know, we already see, uh, I'm, I'm not saying he's wrong, but <coughs> pardon me, we already see a lot of fields with solar, full of solar panels these days, you know, and uh, I'm sure I understand NIMBY, but if it's a choice between having a field full of solar panels, which emit no pollution and make no noise, as opposed to a coal-fired power plant or a refinery next door, right, or a toxic waste dump, people are going to say, put in the solar panels. It's usually not in either or. And in a lot of the opposition has been more to wind turbines, I would say. Yeah, I mean, it, right. the infamous story is that uh, the, the, world, the U.S.'s first offshore wind project, Cape Wind, was proposed for off of... Um, Martha's Vineyard, it, it, it was opposed by uh, the then Senator Ted Kennedy from, from Massachusetts. And the, this, it was only after he died that um, Senator John Kerry, eventual Secretary of State, came out to support that project. You know, and these are Democrats, big climate champions, and they did not want to see those wind turbines from their windows. Right. It hasn't. I don't think it, that one has been. It, it's, it's done. It, it's it never done. went through. And never I would went say through. it's largely but, due to this nimbyism. But the one that did go through is off Block Island. Mm-hmm. And now there's this huge... Which I see every summer from Rhode Island. And by the way, it's not bad. I don't I don't it's, mind it either. No. I, I see wind turbines all over Washington State. I, I think yeah. they're kind of nice. Yeah. But not everybody shares that opinion. I will say the one bright, the one bright spot from a renewable energy perspective and... Trump, the Trump administration said they're they're facilitating a lot of offshore wind leasing um, and they're supporting it. Mm-hmm. And I think they see it as one issue that Trump didn't really sorry, Obama didn't get his hands on too much. And they see that they can actually own this issue. And there's renewable energy executives that are happy with what Trump is doing. By the way, just to give him credit, because it takes uh, a lot of courage to um, swim upstream on Fox News uh, Shep Smith yesterday, I think the one sane voice on Fox News, uh, spoke to this climate uh, report uh, and put it in perspective, I thought. The climate science is accepted science. Governments across the nation are spending billions of dollars preparing for what is to come. The U.S. military, too. Billions of dollars. This is not a political issue. It's science. Uh, I wish it were not a political issue. Um Bill Gates spoke out about this yesterday. Now, he's spending a lot of money on renewable energy. So what what is his take on this report and what we ought to be doing? Well, yeah, he, he spent a lot of money. He has this venture fund with other billionaires like Jeff Bezos and Michael Bloomberg um, where they're investing in, in not just typical renewable energy because actually renewable energy, wind and solar, are doing pretty well and they don't need – They're growing. Uh, they're growing yeah. and, and they're definitely on an upward trajectory. Um, Mr. Gates's <clears throat> focus is on sort of the tougher – 
tougher areas of the global economy that, you know, even if we had the entire electricity sector uh, be powered by wind and solar, it's still only 25 percent of the problem. And it's so therefore, if we solve that, we're still not solving the problem. We need to we need to revolutionize everything about our global economy from the way that we make steel. I mean, the process to make steel and cement emits CO2. Um, and we use CO, we use steel in in wind in wind turbines, for instance. So he's putting money into things like that, and you know he he's not bothering himself with trying to change President Trump's mind. Which in this interview that I did with my uh, my colleague Ina Freed for we have we had a limited series on HBO, and that's what we mm-hmm. ran this for. <clears throat> you know, we really pressed um, Mr. Gates about his interactions with President Trump. He's met with him a couple of yeah. times and tried to press him on this. And, and we try to get him to say, to try to express how he really feels, because we can't imagine he's thrilled with what's happening. And he, and he wouldn't do that. He is instead sort of imploring people to realize that we can't just focus on a sliver of the problem, which is a little wonky, I'll admit, but I do think it's important. But, but you know, he does see the big picture, right? And he's got enough money and resources that he can afford to. Right. right. Uh, you know, one of the last things he Thank said God. to us, right, one of the last things he said to us was that, you know, he thinks like the women's movement in response to the Me Too um, allegations are going to be stronger out of the Trump administration and the Trump era. And then he contrasted that with climate change. And he's like, I don't see the same with climate change. You know, the economy is doing pretty well right now. People are focused on climate change. But I bet you that the second the economy starts to go bad in tanks, concern about climate change will drop. That's how it happened in the past. And I anticipate it'll happen in the future. And so I agree with Mr. Gates. And, and then I concluded it saying that, well, at least Mr. Gates whose net worth is shy of $100 billion, will be able to continue focusing on this. Uh, yeah. Uh, and it's good he's out there focusing on these big issues. And it's good that you're there on Axios reporting on this, too. Amy, nobody's uh, on more on top of it than you are. That's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Samuel Brook. Fred Wertheimer, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.